So, uh, in part one, we went over the young Morgan, Morgan's influences, his education. Um, he was influenced heavily by his father. Um, being a natural illustrator and writer, he did want to produce books. That was his number one. But his father probably instilled in him that in order to support such activity, one must make money. And uh, the Adams Morgan Company, being an entrepreneurial pursuit, um, maybe fulfilled that need for Morgan. Here was a way for him to have, in effect, a cash cow business to support his real passion, which was writing. Writing and uh, teaching and explaining things to young people and experimenters. Uh, this is not unusual. Um, when I was in uh, college, for instance, my first co-op job with, was with such a, uh, I don't know, a, a clairvoyant uh, inventor type. And uh, this guy had a cash cow business of building test equipment for the local uh, large companies like Xerox and Kodak in Rochester, New York. And he never really told us what he did in the back room. Now, of course, the back room in his case uh, was uh, he was building high-end audio amplifiers for the audiophile set. People that could afford to have custom audio equipment built for them, one-offs, and so on. And, of course, he was afraid of people like me, an engineer co-op student, who maybe would uh, be too interested in something like that. So he never let me out back. I was just wire-wrapping uh, circuits all day and uh, using nippers to uh, cut out chassis and things for his test equipment. But uh, on the day that I left, finally, the day I left the business, he allowed me into his inner sanctum and showed me some of the magic uh, audio devices that he was developing. I'm not going to go into them because uh, they're probably a little too special for some of you, but uh, I will say this was the uh, 70s, and he was doing Class A, with MOSFETs, and uh, it was quite advanced for the time. Of course, we all know what Class A is today, but back in the 70s, it was pretty special stuff. So, back to Morgan. Uh, Morgan now has a way to make money, and he's got a way to promote his books. And uh, the books and periodicals in the back of the catalog, as you saw in Part 1, a very important part of his business. So now we're going to... Uh, we're going to have an additional player come into Adams Morgan, a third partner. And uh, that third partner is uh, also the smartest man in the room. What happens when you have two guys that are, that are the smartest men in the room? Some of you have been in that situation as well, maybe in a boardroom or maybe in an engineering meeting, maybe in some type of a uh, expose or... Uh, scientific experiment, there's always somebody that comes in who thinks he's smarter. Uh, stand by. This is part two, Morgan Exposé. In part one of Alfred Morgan Revealed, we covered his early childhood influences, including his education and the early and prodigal grasp he seemed to have on a wide range of electrical and physics subjects and the hardware associated with each subject. We also saw Morgan's ability to present information in a simplified, easy-to-understand manner. The entrepreneurial drive was there, too. He had a child's excitement in what we would now call STEM subjects, clear Boy Scout-like values, and the ability to communicate to young people. Rather than using AMCO as a vehicle for laboratory research and radio development, he used it to provide capital and to promote his writing career and books. But this was about to change in a big way. The company was suddenly going to be presented an opportunity that could potentially shift it from a standard parts supplier, you know, for experimenters, to the epicenter of radio design. This would occur in the person of a third business partner. That third partner would be none other than radio pioneer Paul Godley. Paul Foreman Godley, same age as Morgan, was another wonder kid who at a very young age absorbed everything he could with modern electrics, communications, telegraphy, early wireless, 
and uh, his young years are very storied, very worthwhile to study. We're not going to cover that. Let's pick up his timeline just before running into Morgan. Paul, at age 20, was already teaching courses for the Dodge School in Valparaiso, Indiana, on wireless telegraphy in 1909. He was lecturing and providing textbook material to students. Paul hoped to formalize his education, and he attended the University of Illinois in the 1910-1911 year, the Electrical Engineering Program. In early 1913, with enough knowledge, uh, Paul, at age 24, headed to Brazil on a two-year contract to put together the Amazon in the Andes radio network. This is uh, basically a radio network along the railway system uh, in the Brazilian rainforest along the mountains. This was to serve the rubber plantations and other businesses. The stations set up were very high power. Now these are high power spark stations between 70 and 140 kilowatts. Long wave spark stations operating between 400 and 800 meters and many more modest 5,000 to 10,000 watt stations were set up along the route. Paul returned to the New York area in 1914 with $5,000 in gold from that work in Brazil. He used this to set up his lab in Leonia, New Jersey, 20 or so miles east of Montclair, where Morgan had his factory. Paul was invited to a meeting at the Radio Club of America, known as the RCA, which met uptown in the Estonia Hotel in New York City. Godley was asked at this first meeting to come up and give a few remarks about the Brazilian adventures and the wireless network he installed. After the remarks, he was approached by a big, gangling, bald-headed man who claimed that he had received those stations from Brazil right here in New Jersey and New York with his wireless receiver on numerous occasions. Paul, unbelieving, doubted that any wireless detector could have heard the LF signals at that distance. The man, one Edwin Howard Armstrong, said that he had a new kind of detector that was much more sensitive than any known. Godley asked if the circuit had been applied to the higher wavelengths, above 800 meters. Uh, Armstrong said it had not, and he was trying to secure a foundational patent that would cover all frequencies by extension. Armstrong described the receiver, and Godley began to work immediately in his laboratory in New Jersey. The two men would become trusted friends for many years, with Paul Godley providing construction, development, and demonstration support to Armstrong on several occasions for several of his key breakthrough inventions, including super regeneration, the super heterodyne, and FM. Work commenced on the high frequency version of the regen circuit, concentrating on the 1,000 to 200 meter bands. These are what we would consider to be as medium wave today, but at the time these were very short wavelengths, at the very fringe of where amateurs could operate. Godley set up a Department of Commerce experimental radio station, 2Z Echo, in Leonia, New Jersey, where he began to operate as a relay station with other experimental stations across the nation. They were going to be operating at higher frequencies. Morgan's license was experimental also, but more suited to business than amateur work. At the time, these experimental licenses that Morgan and Godley had covered both experimental factory type work as well as amateur type work. By high frequencies, of course, we mean 500 to 1500 kilohertz, the broadcast band as we know it today. Remember, this was the short waves. In 1912, all work was done below this, and hams are no exception. Everybody was long wave. Experimental work, experimental licenses are still issued, by the way. One that comes to mind in recent times uh, by amateurs is uh, the 500 kilohertz band amateur experimental licenses that the FCC granted for the new 630 meter band uh, that we now have. Some background on the 1912 federal rulemaking that banished hams to 200 meters and down, that is 1500 kilohertz and up. Engineers like the radio boys at the Radio Club of America knew about radio physics. Every time you double your operating frequency, your path losses increase by 6 dB. Each time you double your frequency, 
say 75 kilohertz to 150 kilohertz, 150 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz, and so on, effectively cut your range in half, at least for ground wave and line of sight. They had calculated that the range would be reduced to about 50 to 100 miles at amateur power levels at the higher frequencies. Thus, many relay stations would be required to send signals across greater distances compared to what hams were used to at 75 to 200 kilohertz. This is the basis of the founding of the ARRL. The American Radio Relay League was founded to bridge the gap uh, for these very short amateur ranges that they were going to have on the new frequencies. They honestly thought that the new rulemaking would require message handlers about every 100, 200 miles or so. Crystal set sensitivity and selectivity, uh, at least up to now, was a fixed limiting factor, with only the antenna efficiency providing a means of improving reception. Godley's goal was to bring the 10 to 100 factor sensitivity improvement that Armstrong bragged about uh, in this new detector into the higher frequencies that amateurs would be forced into. Godley knew he had the magic. It was time to prove its capabilities and find a way to produce profit from his work. Experimental station 2Z Echo began to set distance records almost immediately. The extra sensitivity was helping as predicted, but some other factor was helping even more. These new frequencies were going longer distances, especially at night. Coast-to-coast -coast distances were achieved in three relays, and the other stations, most were still using crystal sets. Godley approached Morgan in late 1915 to buy into his business as a one-third partner. Why would he do this? Godley undoubtedly found out about Morgan through published writings in the Adams Morgan catalog. And this is a quote from Rogers. Uh, wanting his new receiver to be built commercially and to profit from the venture also, Godley approached the Adam Morgan Company of Upper Montclair, New Jersey. He offered to buy into the company as an equal partner if it would produce his receiver. Since Adams Morgan Company was supplying only amateur wireless parts at the time, the company accepted the offer and the first Paragon receiver became a reality. Dubbed the RA6, it sold for $35 in 1916 and was quite popular with wireless amateurs, outperforming all the non-regenerative competition." End quote from Rogers. Morgan made the change from a pure component and book supplier to a full-blown radio manufacturer. Godley was on board to commercialize his new regenerative receiver design, which would be called the Paragon. Godley was not in residence in the factory as of yet. He operated from his laboratory, supplied details and plans of the new receiver in a consulting mode. The unit was put into production. We would call this remote engineering or consulting engineering today. The new receiver was a regenerative type directly related to the Armstrong patent, so Adams Morgan had to license the design, paying royalties to Armstrong. The Paragon RA6 was the first Paragon product that was commercialized. Again, it was ready by October 1916. Godley applied Armstrong's regenerative circuit in its very foundational form. He put a variometer in the grid and a variometer in the plate. Thus, it was a tune grid, tune plate regen that used a variometer in the plate circuit as the regen control. All feedback was directly through the tube from plate to grid. There was no tickler coil. And this was a tuner. The actual active circuits, the detector and the audio stages, were always in a separate enclosure. Usually these were built by the amateurs themselves. The actual product from Adams Morgan didn't come out until a couple of years later. But Godley's realization of the Armstrong patent circuit diagram into a high performance receiver is tune plate, tune grid. And it might seem a little unorthodox to you, expecting something more like the standard tickler feedback type. By the way, the feedback region where you see the tickler coil is more related to Meisner's work at Telefunken in Germany. Later, this would be attributed to Armstrong somehow, but in Europe they still call it a Meisner oscillator. Oh, and the RA6 that we consider to be a shortwave receiver covers only, again, the 500 to 2000 kilohertz region.
Remember, this was short waves in 1916. Morgan seems to have worked well with his silent partner, Adams, for several years, but not so with Godley. We know this through the scant literature that we read, that these two were at loggerheads with each other many times. It was confrontation and disagreement pretty much from the start, according to the two sources I have. There's precious little information on the relationship and what actually happened. I can only guess that, at, that various irritations and differences uh, spoiled the relationship over the time that the two men worked together. Neither man records any specifics or boasts about the relationship during this time period. It's like it never occurred. Morgan definitely knows that he had the secret sauce in Godly, and he shamelessly promoted Paragon Paul with many lavish published ads. Maybe someone out there could enlighten me as to what the problem was between these two men. I can only guess at some of the irritations that would have spoiled the relationship. For instance, Godley's insistence of off-site engineering or remote work. One source says that Godley never actually physically uh, was located at the Adams Morgan plant before World War I. So was this possibly a trade secret me measure? Uh, was Godley very protective of his consulting business? I don't know. Godley maintains a consult consulting presence all through the relationship. Uh, was this possibly a conflict of interest that Morgan was upset about? Godley also had a very close relationship to the Radio Club of America, the RCA, and later to the ARRL. Was Godley having trouble separating work from ham radio? Here were two gifted men that had completely different personalities. Morgan was strategic, focused, businesslike, very ethical. Godley was very much a part of the active amateur fraternity, as well as the radio development fraternity. Godley saw no conflict of interest in sharing his time with outside interests, at the expense of AMCO sometimes. Next, World War I starts, and Adams Morgan has to adapt a third time. They did grab some wartime contracts, providing parts to the various military manufacturers. Godley, always the consultant and experimenter, wanted to remain involved with cutting-edge radio development. Godley became an employee of American Marconi in Aldine, New Jersey, running their receiver design program during the war. And the government no doubt felt that Godley was more valuable at Marconi than at Adams Morgan Paragon. And here's a quote. When the United States became involved in World War I, Godley went to work for American Marconi in New Jersey, where he was in charge of receiver design. After the war, it was back to Adams Morgan Company to produce more RA-6 receivers. By this time, the RA-6 was somewhat dated, so Godley designed an updated version called the RA-10. The new RA-10 was ready for release in October 1920 to be sold exclusively by the Continental Radio and Electric Company. So all of this godly activity outside of AMCO no doubt infuriated Morgan. Paul was doing more Paragon products, but he also continued doing experimental and high visibility amateur work with the ARRL, publishing articles, and working and doing consulting and survey work outside of Adams Morgan. I have to think this was part of the arrangement, but obviously it rubbed Morgan the wrong way. Even so, the RA-10 receiver was completed and sold by 1920. The RA-10 and DA-2 audio amplifier detector products were being sold to some pretty well-heeled amateurs. An associated RF press selector box was also added. This was top-of-the-line amateur equipment in 1920-1921. After the war, Godley was approached by the ARRL to be the man in England uh, to man the listening station in the 1921-22 transatlantic tests. Godley had been promoted as the man with the biggest ears in the world by Morgan. But again, running off obviously did not fly with Morgan. By the way, the transatlantic tests are another gigantic subject I just can't get into. It's well covered in the literature. A lot of fun to study that. While gone abroad, 
uh, for the ARRL and the Radio uh, Club of America sponsored uh, transatlantic test, Morgan apparently had enough. He abruptly bought out the silent partner and took majority control of the company. Although they had agreed to an equal partnership that could not be altered without the consent of all, in a totally unexpected move, Morgan bought out Adams and became the majority stakeholder of Adams Morgan Company. As a result, Godley was left in a position of minor partner in a company that he had helped to develop. His designs were being sold and others were in the process of being released for production, so it's not surprising that he temporarily resigned from Adams Morgan and sought to have the courts resolve the morgan Godley dispute. By June of 1922, the courts had forced an agreement which allowed Godley to return to the Adams Morgan Company once more. So, by the early 20s, Adams Morgan had to shift for a fourth time, this time to provide a product for the many new non-amateur broadcast listeners. This was the new market. And Godley had completed the DA2 uh, detector audio design in 1922, the excellent uh, Paragon RB2 broadcast receiver, um, and this RB2 was a TRF regen. That means one stage of RF amplification before the regen stage. Uh, Godley exited for good in 1924 and built up his own consulting company. We have the end of Adams Morgan as Godley exits. There simply is no more secret sauce and the company cannot continue. However, uh, we do know that Morgan continued to write all through this time. So it's not like he stopped being an author. Um, and there's one more thing that occurred that could have sealed Adams Morgan's fate. And this is not really discussed at all in articles. In 1919, Armstrong filed an application for a U.S. patent of the superheterodyne circuit, which was issued the next year. This patent was subsequently sold to Westinghouse. Armstrong finalized the superheterodyne patent. Godley is likely the first person he shares the design knowledge with outside the patent office and his attorney, and Godley quickly builds up a multi-stage IF superheterodyne. This first proper superheterodyne, one would believe that Adams Morgan would have been uniquely set up to proffer for, to profit from this new radio design, and could have, should have, perhaps been the first company to offer a superheterodyne commercially under license to uh, to Armstrong. But at war's end, a deal between Armstrong and three players occurred over the valuable patents. The RCA Corporation was founded in 1919. So this is the Radio Corporation of America. This is not the Radio Club of America. Uh, it was initially a patent trust owned by General Electric, GE, Westinghouse, AT&T Corporation, and the United Fruit Company, specifically to leverage the Armstrong designs and patents. RCA introduced its super heterodyne radiola sets uh, first in the U.S. market in 1924, and they were an immediate success, dramatically increasing the corporation's profits. These sets were considered so valuable that RCA would not license the superheterodyne to other U.S. companies until 1930, uh, deep into the Depression. So I have to believe that Godley's involvement with the build of the superheterodyne, working closely with Armstrong, was a huge blow to Adams Morgan, and specifically to Alfred Morgan, who could have at least been a very well-placed early licensee. Adams Morgan was stuck with the regen, through the early 20s, and this was probably its biggest factor in its demise in 1925. It really needed to have a super heterodyne to compete in the market. Just before Adams Morgan, uh, Morgan of course wrote some text under the Cole Morgan publishing name, but actually Morgan continued to write all through Adams Morgan time period, uh, books like uh, Model Flying Machines, How to Build and Fly Them, 1913, Wireless Telegraph Construction for Amateurs, 1914, The Boy Electrician, 1914, The Amateur's Wireless Handy Book, 1916, Homemade Electrical Apparatus, 1918, uh, Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony, 1920. Also during the 1920-23 time period, 
Morgan has credit for three patents. He clearly had been thrust back into engineering as Godley completed several of the new broadcast designs, all based on improving and unitizing the regenerative sets for the broadcast market. In the period between 1925 and 1935, after Adams Morgan, Morgan begins a series of updates and re-releases of his classic books for new editions. So there's a sizable gap in new writing until 1935 when Morgan begins to write on other children's subjects including pets, fish, chemistry, and so on. During Morgan's most influential writing period, and really the one that we're most familiar with between 1940 and perhaps the early 70s, we find the classic young people books that we found in our school, in our public library, and so on. You may have been attracted to some of his other science and hobby books as well. I will bet that you found The Boy Electrician, uh, probably more likely borrowed The Boy's First Book of Radio and Electronics, or possibly a first radio book for boys in one of his editions. Uh, you might have read and studied the second, third, and fourth book of Radio and Electronics. Uh, did you build some of the projects in these books? Let me know in the comments. Morgan did a commendable job with the transition between tube and solid state uh, in this book set, and uh, the illustrations are fantastic. However, these books are not perfect, as some of you uh, found out the hard way. Uh, there were both graphical and typographical errors in the project drawings that drove some of us nuts. Some errors are just now being revealed, in fact. Thus is the bane of publishing technical material that's hard to proof and edit. So I hope you've enjoyed this plunge into the world of Alfred Powell Morgan. Of course, in the third video, we will have to build one of his projects. I know that my research and reference sourcing and use of materials from the internet was sloppy in this approach on understanding Alfred Morgan, but I hope that this deep dive will spur some more serious research into the pivotal period of radio development between 1915 and 1925. Original edition Morgan books are highly prized and valuable. Many of Morgan's early works are now in the public domain, being more than 100 years old. And as you are finding out, many are being re-released. These too are in high demand. Morgan's books are simply so well constructed and illustrated that they continue to set the standard for writers attempting to deliver STEM subject on a sixth grade level. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this second installment of Morgan Revealed. Uh, Morgan Revealed uh, kind of went into some areas where I didn't have the full information and I had to connect the dots in a way that maybe uh, bent history a little bit, but uh, gave you a flavor for what we're talking about here, a flavor for what Morgan was doing and what drove him. So some of you have noticed on the table, I've got the 1H4 Regen from uh, Radio Book for Boys and the first edition of the Boys' uh, first book of radio and electronics, uh, the 1H4, of course, being the battery tube. In part three, we're going to go through the, uh, the regen, and uh, this guy is built right to, uh, to print. We're going to go through each part of this and uh, see how this regen compares to the later regen using the 6BF6.